This is the first lesson in our series called Faithful Conversations, How the Body of Christ Talks. This is an important uh, topic to discuss in our world today because we all know, just from a simple view of the news, the newspaper headlines, we are more divided today than ever. And that is not what we're going to be talking about, our division anyway, but maybe one solution to it, which is conversation. Faithful conversations, how the body of Christ talks. And in this first week, I want to talk about the dynamics of conversation. But first, let's talk about babies. Because babies are the beginning. The same way we learn how to talk, we could learn a lot from babies. How do babies learn how to communicate? Well, they're cute and they're cuddly, so we love them and we go out of our way to take care of them. Uh, they communicate most of their needs in the beginning by crying. I've thankfully forgotten what that was like with my two kids. Uh, when they're hungry, when they're thirsty, when they're in pain, when they need a clean diaper, they cry. Sometimes, even the most attentive parents do not know why their children are crying. And the other thing that's going on when babies are new is that they're learning connections. They're learning that sounds mimic uh, sounds. They're making sounds to mimic the people around them. They're gradually learning to control these sounds, and they over time make associations between the mimic sounds that they're making and people or objects. So they begin to connect the song Mama with that lady who brings them food. The other thing they learn is the connection of their body. They learn that they have a body. They learn, you know, that they can put food in their mouth with this and they learn over time to feed themselves, they learn to focus their eyes, they learn how to move their eyes. All the ways that infants learn are rooted in the growing realization that their body parts are connected to one another and they can converse with other beings and through that communication, they're connected. Not only can they communicate, but they can learn on their own and from others. And so this is the beginning of human communication. And it strikes me that the church works in the same way. The story of the earliest Christians in the New Testament unfolds with these uh, groups that were once homogenous becoming more diverse and they're slowly coming together and they're growing to maturity in some cases, and they're learning to communicate. Like a baby with their parents, the young church has the guidance we see in the New Testament by faith through the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but also the disciples who were with Jesus, now apostles. Paul talks about the early church coming to the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. He goes on to say that as they do this, they attain the full stature of Christ. And this is despite the fact that you have a church that's growingly, as we said, becoming more diverse, as Paul says in Galatians 3. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. But you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so, but as the church goes on, we find out, Paul chides the church for their lack of maturity. A lack of maturity is the problem. And so here's the point of today. As the author of the book that we're leaning on for this study says, our church bodies have a few actions that they can do pretty well. They can gather together for worship. They can serve their neighbors. They can introduce children and youth to some important Bible studies. But just like the Corinthians that Paul uh, writes to in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, we are divided by our loyalties to political parties, to theological traditions, 
or to maybe even a variety of leaders or Christian leaders in the world today. In our immaturity, we don't know how to talk and work together well. And this limits the capacity of what churches can do together. And so one of the solutions to this problem is learning how to have conversation. And so in this lesson, we'll begin with group dynamics. And the first most important dynamic of conversation is group size. And it begins with um, the difference between a conversation between two people and a larger group. The more people, the more complex the conversation. Some researchers say that five to seven is the ideal size for a conversation that leads to growth or that leads to new realizations, expanded horizons. So the more people you involve, the more complex it becomes. And the larger the group, uh, the more it's just carried by the extroverts. And those of us who are in the middle or the introverts, introverts are more and more just sitting on the sidelines. And we've all uh, been in this situation. This is why I always said the best conversation is a lecture. And maybe that's just because I am set through a lot of group conversations when we had to do group projects. And that meant you had to work together with a group of people and the whole point of the exercise was working together to produce something. And it was always easier just to assign parts and divide up and do it on your own and then come together and combine them. Of course, that wasn't the point of the exercise. I always loved the classes where we had a really good lecture because I could learn from an expert. And I remember thinking, well, group conversation is just a sharing of ignorance. But that ignores the question that we began this study with today, which is, if the point is learning to work together better, to grow closer together, to be strengthened by variety and difference, then we can't do that without conversation. And so the next dynamic is, of course, building on that, which is group homogeneity. We like to talk to people who are like us. And this is probably the greatest challenge of the 21st century as societies become more diverse. As churches and small towns and schools, universities, workplaces grow in difference, we tend to want to shelter in place and find neighborhoods of people like ourselves, groups of people like ourselves. Um, I used to, in my evangelical days, att occasionally attend mega churches, and for a long time the trend was, instead of neighborhood small groups, having small groups based on interests. So all the people who like cars, let's put them in a small group. All the people who like cooking, let's put them in a small group. All the people who like reading history books, let's put them in a small group. Well, I'm sure those groups were fun, but did it... Um, grow towards the maturity of Christ Paul was talking about at the beginning of this lesson. We have a diverse society. We're divided by language. We, even if we're speaking the same language, we have cultural expressions that come from our region or our particular background that we have to explain to other people. And we all know good examples of this. Um, and then there are the unspoken modes of communication. One of my best friends in the whole world. I'm the godfather of three of his children. He comes from a Latino background. And I come from a Swedish background, and maybe it's because of my family, or maybe it's my culture, I don't know, but I'm the most, I'm pretty naturally monotone and flat, and he was always big and happy and joyous. And uh, it was amazing that we became such good friends. But in the beginning, he used to think, oh, Tom's mad at me, or Tom doesn't like me. And that's because in his culture and in his family, there was, they were used to a big greeting. 
And uh, when he finally explained that to me, I said, no, this is just how we are. In my family, we're like, oh, hi, how you doing? Good to see you. That's pretty meaningful. So then from then on, when I saw him, I'd say, hey, good to see you. And I knew that that was important to him, and, and he knew he didn't always have to be that way for me. And we grew as friends. And as I said, now I'm the godfather of his children. But that's an example of unspoken mode of communication. And so we need to get beyond group homogeneity because as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would, would, that, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? You get the idea. Paul is comparing the human body to the church, the people. We each have different roles, functions, backgrounds, interests, cultures, and that is what makes us the body of Christ. And so we can't always be drawn to homo homogeneity. We have to be drawn to diversity, and we have to seek it at times. Um, the truth is we might find it easier to communicate with people who are like us, but Paul, challenge, Paul challenges the usefulness of this approach for the strengthening of the body of Christ. One more group dynamic. Formal or informal? I love informal conversation. As I already told you in this session, formal conversation sometimes makes me uncomfortable. But like informal conversations, formal conversations must happen because they teach us patience with each other. In an informal way, it's pretty easy to get out of it. In a formal way, we have to sit and listen. And we have to work through our differences. Um, informal conversations are spontaneous, but the truth is they both require intentionality. Think of a musician. I have a good friend who is a great guitarist. And I'm sure there's two, type of, two types of guitar playing he does, probably more than one. When he's by himself, he probably plays those familiar things that are comfortable to him to help him relax or to take his mind off of things. Um, when he's with friends, he would, close friends, he'd probably really play those things. But then uh, he'd also have to have practice times to learn new things. And that requires us to stretch, to come out of our comfort zone. Um, I was a golfer growing up. My dad was a club pro, and I really wanted to be a good golfer. And the pro told me, if you want to be a good golfer, wait till there's a winter day with a north wind, and go out and hit into the north wind, because our driving range pointed north. And he said, when your hands are bleeding, you've hit enough. Because if you're in the British Open someday, you're going to be hitting into a cold wind. And so I would do stuff like that. Now I regret it because I didn't become a pro. Now I don't regret it. But you get the idea. Informal or formal conversations require intentionality if we're to grow from them. And so here's the big question. Why do we resist conversation? Why do we resist conversation? And I think the truth is because growth is difficult. Now, the fruits of the Spirit do not grow in isolation. The fruits of the Spirit, according to Paul and Galatians, are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. 
We can't learn these on an island by ourselves. Maybe patience. Maybe some of them we could. But we resist conversation, I think, because like a baby, we don't realize our connection. Our connection to each other. That what's bad for my neighbor is also bad for me. And so may we, today, begin to think about a conversation. And how often we stretch ourselves to listen to people who are different from us or to take an approach of gentleness towards them so that they'll listen to us. May we grow in our conversation. We'll see you in this study next time.